this. So let me write it down here. Um, microscopic view of current flow. So what I want you to imagine is, um, let's say you have this pipe which represents a piece of wire or some conductor. And you set up a checkpoint like the one that we are describing here. And at this checkpoint, you measure some amount of current flowing. Okay? Then, now what I'm trying to get at is I want to actually consider the uh, movement of individual charges. So let's say I have current flowing from left to right, some amount I, and I want to describe this in terms of actual makeup of this material. So what I want you to imagine is that within this conductor are free charges, each of some charge plus Q, okay? uh, and which are you know, moving at some speed, which are moving at some speed to the right. Let me call this some kind of average speed. So you know, like with the kinetic uh, theory of gas, when you have such a large collection of particles, they're going to have their individual velocities. But I'll just say, all right, some average velocity moving to right. We actually have a word for this. This is called drift velocity. Because if I wasn't applying any voltage, they would have, on average, zero velocity. But once I apply a voltage difference, then they will have some non-zero drift velocity. Yeah? So what else do you think you need to know to figure out what the amount of current is? So remember, the current is measured in units of columns per second. Right? What you have so far are two quantities. You know, unit of one quantity here that's given in columns. But unit of this other quantity, it's a little bit weird. I mean, you do have a sense that drift velocity will be involved in discretion of current, right? But the velocity, like all velocities, it's given in units of meters per second. So you got this length, unit of length here that you kind of don't want in the end. You want to get rid of it. So how do we get rid of it? Divided by what? I don't have any quantity of length here. Yeah, it's uh, hard to guess uh, when you see it for the first time. So let me draw a picture of what you're considering here. Um, actually, what you're considering here is the exact same things that I was describing earlier. So I'm trying to measure current. So what I'm trying to do is, all right, I look at, um, I look at um, how, many, um, how many particles are passing through in some amount of time. So I want to describe current as some um, number of charges divided by some amount of time delta t, right? And let's just say we are, um, let's see. Let's say we look at some um, region, so I think this is one way I can count the number of charges that will cross the surface. I, so starting from here, I look back some distance, d. And this is how I am going to pick my distance d. My distance d will be based on the amount of time that I am going to look at and the amount of speed. So d will be, let me write it down first, the average velocity divided by, no, no. Average velocity multiplied by the delta t that I'll look at. What do you, th what do you think separates the charges within this distance from the charges outside that distance? What's the difference? 
What's the one thing you can say about the charges that lie within this volume? They are, well, I mean, they are all assumed to be moving at the same average velocity. So that's true of every single charge here. But something's different about charge A here compared to charge B here. What's the dividing line? Sorry. Closer to the checkpoint. In fact, this parameter is D. When you look at this definition here, it was chosen so that whatever charge is within the distance d will be able to cross the checkpoint in the time delta t. Whatever charge is outside won't be able to cross it. Yeah? So if I count all the charges that are within distance d, that will be my number of charges. So let me count it this way. I'm going to need, um, so I, I feel like I have all the parameters I will need for the volume of this uh, space. So I will need to introduce a couple more. So I will need to know the area, cross-sectional area. So cross-sectional area times d will give me the volume, right? But I don't want volume. I want number of charges. So the way I'm going to express the number of charges is this way. I'm going to say, well, number of charges, that's going to be equal to some amount of volume times charge density. And I'm just going to use a letter that's the standard letter for charge density. It's a little bit weird, lowercase n. This is what's sometimes called number density. As in, it's the number of particles per, um, number of particles per, um, uh, per volume. So you multiply it by volume, you get the number of particles. Uh, oh, I forgot one. I have to multiply by charge per particle. That way I get the actual amount of charge in coulombs. Good. So does this make sense as the quantity in the numerator for the amount of charge? Yes, Miguel, does this make sense? That this expression expresses the amount of charge that's crossing this boundary in amount of time delta t. OK, so um, yeah, so we write it all out. So I have delta t on the bottom. Let me write out volume in terms of d and um, um, d. So all this is n times the volume. So cross-sectional area times d um, times q, still divided by delta t. Let me substitute in what d is. Then this is uh, charge density times q, amount of charge per um, particle times area times d, that's uh, drift velocity times the, um, the duration of time that we looked at. And when we write out this far, you will see the amount of time canceling out, which is what we wanted from the beginning, and um, like this, which matches with our intuition, that however long a time we look at shouldn't actually affect our results. So this is the microscopic description of current flow. When we are looking at some amount of current, I, that you can measure macroscopically, like using this um, um, power supply or some sort of current meter, that's going to equal some charge density times um, amount of charge per um, particle times cross-sectional area times the drift velocity of the particle. And when you work out all the units, it'll turn out that they all work out. Because um, from the combination of Q times V, you get Coulomb times meter per second. And the combination of number density times area will actually give you one over meter. So the unit of meter will cancel out, and um, we'll get this. But I want you to introduce this as a way to talk a little bit about um, some co a convention that we are going to follow. So from your knowledge of most materials, what is the actual charge that's flowing? Like what's the, um, so but I was describing some positive charge that's moving from left to right here. Is that what actually happens in a material or is it something different? 
what actually happens in a material. What's the charge that moves? It's the electrons that move. So the actual view of actual picture of charge is that when you describe a current from left to right, it's actually going to be electrons that's flowing from right to left. But we are going to use this um, sort of fictional pic uh, convention that as if the, when we describe the direction of current, it's going to be as if the charges are moving or um, positive. So when you have negative charges flowing one way, to say that, uh, to actually describe the direction of current, we say current is actually flowing the other way. Just the convention we have, you just have to blame Benjamin Franklin for that because he's the one responsible for us assigning a negative symbol to um, electrons instead of it the other way around. Um, so that's one convention I wanted to describe. Um, the other one comes down to this, sort of the origin of Ohm's law and why Ohm's law is, you know, quote unquote law, not the real law. So um, once you have this much description, then I can describe Ohm's law um, in the, the microscopic version. This is the microscopic version. Or, um, yeah, this is the microscopic version of Ohm's law. So, microscopic version of Ohm's law. It, so, you know, Ohm's law that we stated here, it relates current to the volts, right? But as you remember, the volts are related to the electric field. So when we go microscopic, instead of describing volts, which is related to some having finite interval, we want to talk about electric field. So the microscopic version of Ohm's law tells you, well, how much electric field there is inside the conductor like this when you set up a situation for current to flow here. So microscopic version of Ohm's law says this. It says um, amount of electric field that you apply uh, inside a conductor, that it's a proportional to what's called the current density. Um, so let me define current density here. Current density, or the magnitude of it anyway, is amount of current divided by cross-sectional area. This makes intuitive sense as the density of current, right? That you divide it by area, not the volume. Like you don't care about the volume because you know along this dimension, like current, like yeah. So so that's why you divide by area. This is the quantity we call current density. Um, so it's proportional to make it equal the way we did it for Ohm's law. We introduce um, quantity here, and actually it's the quantity that you have already seen. Resistivity. So microscopic version of Ohm's law says that um, electric field is equal to the um, resistivity of the material times the amount of current, the, the current density. And this is really the uh, reason I want you to go through this discussion introduce all of this. Um, let me put it this way. Um, so we have some relationships here between some of the dynamic quantities that I want to relate. Uh, the, let me tell you the two dynamic quantities I want to relate. I want to relate electric field to the drift velocity in the, in the some sort of proportionality. Like I want to say, well, how are those two related? So I can go through this way. So electric field is equal to this. So what I can say is, um, well, I guess I can just take this divided by area, that will be my current density. 
and put it in here. So this, so this is what I can say. Electric field, which is proportional to current density. Current density is proportional to the current itself. Holding area is constant. And current is proportional to the drift velocity. So connecting all of this together, what we are saying is that, um, let me flip it around, drift velocity is proportional to electric field. And this statement should be surprising. So drift velocity is a kinematic quantity, right? It's describing speed of something. All right. What quantity does electric field relate to that can be related to kinematics of a particle? Like in the very basic definition of electric field. First? Force, yeah. I mean, that's, that was the very basic definition of electric field. That electric force on a charge is given by electric field. That's how he defined electric field. So when, so in this material, if we are saying that there has been on, uh, what color can I use? Uh, let me use blue. Uh, if we are saying that we have set up an electric field by application of voltage, that what we are saying is that it, uh, we have set up the situation here so that each one of these particles feel a constant force to the right, right? So do you expect velocity to be proportional to the force or, or let me put it this way. So this is the average velocity, right? Do you expect average velocity to be proportional to the force or acceleration or somehow a little bit different? If you have some fixed distance and Um, actually, that might actually be the case. Hmm. I don't know why. My, my intuition said that um, it should really be uh, velocity squared that's proportional to the electric field. Oh, I know why. Um, I can explain my intuition. Imagine you are pushing a particle from here to here, applying a constant force, right? then the amount of energy that you're putting in, it can be described by amount of work you are doing, right? So on the right hand side, let's say you describe the amount of work. That would be work. That will be force times uh, some length that you are moving the charge across. Well, force is the electric field times the charge times the distance you are pushing the charge across. Now the amount of work you are putting in, if you say energy is conserved, then the amount of work you are putting in should equal change in kinetic energy, right? So if that's the case, then change in the kinetic energy, let's say it's starting from rest, so it's going from rest to, to some final speed here. So um, that's one half mass times final velocity squared. That uh, should be equal to the amount of work you are putting in. So if we are going through this, then what you would have expected is that the final speed squared is proportional to the electric field. Like this is what you would have expected. But the situations that are described by Ohm's law Following from this, this is the result we get. It's not the speed squared that's proportional to the electric field. It's the speed that's proportional to the electric field. So how come? So which part of these steps is wrong? So I'm kind of out of time, so let me just give you the answer. The part of the step that is wrong is really here. The step that says the work that I'm doing goes into the kinetic energy of the particle. 
That would be true if there was no friction, if these char charges didn't interact with other stuff within the material. In most cases, that's not the case. They interact. The amount of work that I'm putting in actually doesn't go into kinetic energy. It goes into the thermal energy of the particle. So, so the fact that this is true and this is false uh, relates to something that we call refer to something that we refer to by this name. And we'll talk about this when we talk about electric power, which we didn't get to today, but we will get to it sometime on Wednesday, is um, the fact that this is true is related to what's called joule heating of a material. And joule heating refers to where you are putting in some amount of power using this power supply. And the power that you are putting, energy that you are putting in, doesn't go into increasing kinetic energy of these charges. It instead goes into increasing the thermal energy of the material wire that you are putting it through. And we describe it as dual heating. And there's even a formula for it. I'll just write it down and we'll get to it um, on Wednesday. The power of dual heating is given by amount of current squared times the resistance. And um, We'll get to that on Wednesday, but I want you to have this uh, picture in your mind that whenever Ohm's law is true, once again, it's not always true, but whenever it's true, it will always involve some kind of loss of electrical energy to uh, frictional thermal energy. Like If you ever have a situation where that's not the case, where electrical energy is conserved, it doesn't transform into other forms of energy, then Ohm's law won't be true. Because Ohm's law being true, essentially this relationship holding true, is just uh, contradictory with mechanical energy being uh, conserved. Yeah. Okay, so that's all I have, well, all I can cover today. Uh, so in the lab today, we'll try to build your intuition for circuits. Um, I think we did cover everything you needed for the lab, because 